still one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. When my friends ask me why I'm a trainman, I can only answer, because I like it. That's what my grandpa used to say, because I like it. It's always been that way from the beginning. All aboard, folks! On America's first trains, see the miracle of 1830. I saw it all right, and it was so noisy, the fireman, he sat on a hissing safety valve to make it quieter, and it sure did, till the train blew up. And that's a fact, son. It's an outrage, an absolute outrage. I say unto you, they are devices of Satan to lead immortal souls to hell. As a scientist, I can state that going more than 30 miles an hour will mean instant death by suffocation. Few care. Most are infected by a new disease called railroad fever, leaving the farms and villages for the great adventure of railroading. I wouldn't marry a farmer. He's always in the dirt. I'd rather like a hero. We go in places nobody's ever been to before, and we're getting there fast. Hear what Davy Crockett said? I can only judge of the speed by putting my head out to spin, which I did, and overtook it so quick that it hit me smack in the face. You hear? The train's going all the way out to Chicago now. 3,000 people living there already. By the 1850s, the tracks stretch halfway across the country. The brave, the eager, the restless are on their way, searching for the hidden promise of unknown America. Seeking the same promise, millions more are coming from Europe. Into New York come the Irish, fleeing the terrible potato famine and gambling on America to give them a new chance. Dear Mother, America has truly welcomed me. As I stepped off the boat, a railroad agent met me and gave me a job at a lovely dollar a day. But it seems that a dollar a day is less than the Americans get, for it can barely buy your bread over here. Oh, we're trampled in the dust over here, over here. Oh, we're trampled in the dust, but the Lord in whom we trust will give us crumb for crust over here, over here. Ooh. This country is in a terrible depression. Worse yet, my fellow workers look at us with scorn because they fear they will soon be forced to work for the same terrible low wages we, God forbid. Some speak of a union, a good idea perhaps, but dangerous. The times are dangerous and in many ways. 1861, we are in part a slave economy. 
And President Lincoln has said that no nation can exist half slave and half free. As the world's first troop trains rumble across the country, John Brown's terrible prophecy comes to pass. The crimes of this country cannot be solved but with blood. Straight was the course to the top of the hill, and the rebels with shot and shell. Plowed furrows of death in the toiling ranks, and guarded them as they fell. There soon was a horrible dying yell from the heights they could not gain. And those that doom and death had spared rode slowly back again. There was none to write to the blue-eyed girl the words her lover had said. While mother at home is awaiting her boy, she'll only know he's dead. Death by murder. It is the final bitterness of this bloodiest of wars. Although I am only 22, I was honored to be chosen as a trainman on the president's funeral train and helped to bring him home to Springfield. We roamed the country so the people could mourn him. God grant brother will never take up arms against brother again. He's coming home to Illinois. The old man sadly said, He's not a coming as a passenger. He's coming to us dead. And then a whistle pierced the air. The slow train. dies, but his truth goes on. He's not a coming as a passenger. He's coming to us dead. The end of the war brings restlessness and change. A new kind of transportation sweeps the country. Herman, they've put the train up in the air. Don't walk under there. Ah, uh, New York was too crowded for me. So I got on the railroad and I went to the end of the line, Omaha. Then I took the wagon west. Now I'm digging for gold. Going to California? That's still where the gold is. How long you figure? Oh, about six months from Omaha. They take their tools for mining. They take guns and ammunition. They take clothing, food, and water. They take medicines and coffins. Americans have dreamt of the moment when the whole nation will be linked together by rail from east to west. Now at last, the railroads will try to push across the whole country right to the Pacific. It's a big country and it's a beautiful country, but it's a tough country. There are mountains to conquer, rivers to ford, forests to penetrate. Two railroads take up the challenge. Heading west from Omaha, the Union Pacific. Heading east from California, the Central Pacific. The two railroads are to join. It will be a race to see who lays more track, for the prize is land and money. To each company, the government will give 20 square miles of public lands for each mile of track they lay. They will own all the oil, coal, timber, gold, or other minerals to be found in these lands. Little wonder they drive the men at breakneck speed. Ten 
spikes to the rail, 400 rails to the mile, 1,800 miles to San Francisco. 21 million times are those sledges to come down with their sharp punctuation before the line is completed. They said they wanted me to work the men like mules. Well, there's only one way to work a mule. With a whip. Who worked the Union Pacific? We did. Ex-soldiers from the Civil War armies, immigrants, mainly Irish, and the men of the plains and mountains. But the Central Pacific, heading eastward from California, has a problem. Their workers keep quitting. We ain't in California to work on the railroads. We're here to dig for gold. The superintendent of the Central Pacific comes up with an idea. I thought that if the Chinese were capable of building themselves a great wall, well, maybe they could build us a railroad. Preposterous. Well, let me try it first with 50. If it works, we can bring them over from China by the boatload. It works. And soon there are 12,000 Chinese on the Central Pacific payroll. The land the trainmen have to push through is vast. There are cities and towns in the East and Midwest, and some settlements in California, but in between, nothing, absolutely nothing, except the towns the trains bring with them, towns of saloon keepers, gamblers, and prostitutes, called Hell on Wheels. The gin mills, the girls, and the gamblers create a bit of hell and help the workmen forget for a while the back-breaking labor, the mud, the sickness, and above all, the loneliness. Foreign visitors have a different impression of the hell on wheels towns. Of course, they are only tourists. Roaring impromptu cities full of gold and death. Say, our Sultan and Camorra return to the earth. Bravo. They are magnificent establishments of pleasure. I say it again. Bravo. A few of the Hell on Wheels towns remain to become respectable communities. Most pick up and disappear when the railheads move on. Work in the Union Pacific, we got a lot of trouble with the Indians. It ain't enough to be good with a pick and shovel. You gotta be good with a shotgun, too. They made a bold dash till they come near our train. The owls fell around us like showers of rain. But with our long rifles, we fed them hot lead. Too many a brave warrior around us lay dead. We heard the Sioux Indians all out on the plain, all killing poor workmen and burning their trains, all killing poor trainmen with arrows and bows, and captured by Indians, no mercy that show. On the Central Pacific, we don't have much trouble with the Indians, probably because we give them free rides. 
We give each of the old chiefs a pass, put on the passenger cars, and let the common Indians ride the freight cars whenever they see fit. No trouble with the engines, but we sure have a lot of trouble with the weather. Winter snow sometimes 10 feet high. Avalanches. It's almost impossible getting supplies to the job. The Chinese are remarkable. Without them, we couldn't have built a line. Not to be outdone by the Chinese of the Central Pacific, the Irish immigrants working on the Union Pacific push ever westward. I thought we were supposed to have met the other line by now. Keep going. I hear we passed them. Hey, what's going on? Keep working. The company gets paid for every mile of track it lays. So lay track. On one 600-mile stretch alone, the tycoons make a profit of $30 million. To get as much land and money as possible, the two companies keep laying track until they pass each other by 100 miles. It takes an act of Congress to make them finally stop and link up. Promontory Utah is chosen as a place where the two lines will officially meet. May 9th, 1869, everyone awaits the news. The great event is to be announced over the country's first nationwide telegraph hookup. Two trains are approaching. Telegrapher, are you ready? Yes, sir. The silver hammer Governor Stanford will use to drive in the golden spike has been wired so that when it hits the spike, a telegraph signal will alert the whole country. To all stations, when the golden spike is driven, we will say done. Listen for the signals from the blow of the hammer. Governor Stanford has raised the hammer for the golden spike. He missed. He missed the damn thing! Governor Stanford has missed the golden spike! Don't stop! Send the signal anyway! Say done! 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 The engineer pulls the throttle, the bombing rings the bell, conductor hollers all aboard, and away we go to hallelujah! The party is on not only at Promontory, but throughout America. Hallelujah, 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 God glory in my soul. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. New railroads crisscross the land. People are eager to take advantage of this modern way of getting to distant places fast. Dear John, isn't it wonderful that the children and I leave New York on Saturday and we'll all be together again in San Francisco in only seven or eight days? Your loving wife. Well, if you could stop when you wanted and if you were not locked up in a box with 50 or 60 tobacco chewers, and if the engine and fire didn't burn holes in your clothes and the smell of smoke and oil in the chimney didn't poison you, and you weren't in danger of being blown sky high or knocked off the rails, it would be a perfect way to travel. And if you think traveling on the train is bad, you should see what happens when you stop and get off for a bite to eat. Now the beefsteak, it was rare, and the butter had red hair, and the baby had his feet both in the stew. Not touch if you kick one it would hatch in that awful railway hash house where I go. To help provide better eating facilities, Frederick H. Harvey advertises Wanted young single women of good character, attractive and intelligent, 18 to 30. Soon hundreds of Harvey girls are serving trainmen and passengers wholesome meals along the route of the great Santa Fe. Frederick Harvey gives his customers their money's worth, but only their money's worth. An honest but frugal type, his dying words are reported to be, Slice the ham thinner.
Now that the transcontinental railroad is completed, cattle can be shipped from the great ranges of the West. The new work of rounding up cattle creates a new breed of men, the cowboy. Now a cowboy's life is a weary thing. It's rope them and brand them and drive and sing. They ride the range from sun to sun. For a cowboy's work, Lord, is never done. The land is vast. The land is good. The land is cheap. If it's public land, the government practically gives it away. If it's private land, you can buy it from the railroads. They're eager to set you up as a homesteader and ship your produce to market. I didn't mind being packed like a sardine into what they call a Zulu car. And I didn't mind finding out that being a homesteader ain't all it's cracked up to be. What I do mind is now that I finally got some produce, those damn railroads are charging me a fortune to ship it. They're bleeding me dry. But they stay and they ship, and they make the Wild West and railroading a legend. Come all you rounders if you want to hear a story about a brave engineer. A.Z. Jones was a rounder name on a six-day wheel, the boy won his fame. He was coming down the hill, doing 90 miles an hour, when his whistle dog into a stream. He was found in the wreck with his head on the throttle. He was calling to death by the stream. Oh, listen to the jingle, the rumble, and the roar. As she glides along the woodlands through the hills and by the shore. Hear the mighty rush of the engine, the yeah, locomobile's call. shining bright they robbed the glendale train with the keeper on his knees he delivered up the keys to the outlaws frank and jesse jane poor jesse had a wife to mourn for his life the children they were brave but that dirty little coward that shot mr howard had laid poor jesse Train men. While a train's being robbed, you rarely get to see those brave marshals. Wyatt Earp, Luke Short, and Bat Masterson. But as empty plains of the nation are laced with railroad tracks, the Wild West is tamed. America builds its cities. America's first really bigness is the railroads, and the rails run across everything. Industry, agriculture, politics, morals. While wages are cut, the power and... Here, opera glasses for $75,000? Well, why not? Their money reaches into Congress and the courts. It begins to seem that the tycoons own everything, including the country. As one railroad magnate puts it, We have the legislature on our side, the courts on our side, and we hire the law by the year. The public outcry for regulation is put in its place by Commodore Vanderbilt. The public be damned. Trainmen killed this year, 3,000. Injured, 32,000 men. For years now, a safer break has existed, but the railroads, for the most part, have refused to install it. Ah, they won't do a damn thing as long as brakes cost more than brakemen.
1877. They cut our pay another 10%. 18 hours a day for a dollar and a half. Who can live on it? I say we should strike. Me too. My wife says better to starve quick than slow. But we got no union. Shh. They just hung 11 men for organizing in the coal mines. Yeah, but they're striking the railroads in West Virginia. Oh, it's spreading all right. Here the governor sent the county militia into Pittsburgh. Yeah, but the militia joined the strikers. <laughs> <laughs> no freights moving anywhere. Trouble races along the tracks. Strikes are breaking out in Toledo, Columbus, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Chicago, and all this without a union. The head of the Pennsylvania Railroad says, Give the strikers a rifle diet for a few days and see how they like that kind of bread. Now 600 state militia are ordered to Pittsburgh. They fire directly into the strikers. Enraged, the townspeople, 20,000 strong, join the strikers. In Pittsburgh alone, 26 workers are killed. In only two weeks, it's all over. Across the country, over one... But the fact remains that for two weeks, the workers have stopped the nation's railroads. Things will never again be the same.